uh, tip in the investigate portion of the wheel. So, like, as a player, um, they'd be confused and quite frustrated with the fact that, you know, you know, do I have, like I said, do I have to keep tipping her? Like, what's, how do I get more information? Uh, we, we broke the rules. As designers, we broke the rules. Uh, and we didn't uh, fulfill our uh, expectation of the player. So, you know, in that same vein, if we move tip to P Renegade, we also add a new subtext to it. So, uh, you know, anybody can use their imaginations as to what that can be. But, um, you know, it, once again, what we're describing here is that the predictability of the, of the interface influences the narrative. So we're going to be looking now at giving players choices they want. Now, this is kind of in the realm of writing and how the writers craft narrative for us. And it's all about trying to just give you the choices you want as you want to make them. So, uh, for example, um, in, in the game, uh, you know, uh, I showed an example yesterday of VFS where, where Tally uh, finds her dead dad and she's crying. And, you know, people are like, wow, you know, I wish I could just give her a hug. And all of a sudden the interrupt comes up and you can give her a hug. And it's like, wow, that was fantastic. The designer read my mind. And that's kind of what I'm talking about here. So we're going to be looking at a, uh, a clip here. And this will be the interrogation sequence on Thane loyalty where this guy is really just being a prick and he's, and he's, in, a, and he, and he's, uh, he's in a chair and you're interrogating him. And the fantasy of fulfillment really is you get to beat up a suspect. It's a, it's a very common thing. And if we didn't give players that choice, I'm sure we would have got a lot of hate mail. So we're going to be looking at that clip right now. I want to see my advocate. Your advocate hasn't arrived. We're trying to find him. I'm not saying a damn word until he's here. You two are in way over here. Pay attention, Mr. Callum. That wasn't a good idea, kid. That is gonna cost you. Control your temper. We want him to talk. Sorry. My associate gets a little... excited during interrogations. Hit me again, asshole. Every bunch is another credit in my pocket. Works for me. No! Do you know what I'll do to you when I get out of here? Keep it up, tough guy. You'll leave in a bag. Go to hell. So... Right there, it's like, you know, he's, he's talking smack to you. And if we didn't give you the option, people would have got really frustrated because it's not a traditional role-playing game where you have a million options all the time. We give you a very limited amount of options. But we have to make sure we give you the right options at the right time. So there's always the flip side of the coin. Um, so we're going to give you an, uh, another kind of thing that we should put the game where we break this covenant of giving you choices that you want. So we're going to be looking at the Citadel shopkeeper here and um, some, some crazy dialogue choices that come out of that for no reason. So... Good day, my friends. Welcome to the Citadel. So you're given this I a choice. It's accuser of classism. And it's like, she just said good day. And you're just going to accuse her of classism? Like, this is crazy. Okay, well, I guess let me just make a choice and see what happens. You know, for a bunch of cheap touristy crap, your prices are pretty high. I am sorry you feel that way. There are many stores on the Citadel. Perhaps another would be more in your price range. So, you're saying I'm poor? Just because I'm not as well off as you doesn't mean you can hold yourself above me. What? No, I... Hey, everyone! This store discriminates against the poor! Uh, please, calm down! As an apology, I'll let you have my station employee discount. Is that acceptable? Well, all right. But you still hurt my feelings. Please, enjoy your shopping experience. So, as funny as it was, um, you know, the game's so large that it's hard for us to catch a lot of those things. And, and we could have done things to fix this up. We could have added some banter with her, with another customer before uh, the interaction that would have set that up. 
Um, but the idea there is you were given a, an absurd choice and that wasn't, uh, we didn't set you up for. And that really broke people's role playing experiences uh, with that interaction. So we have this idea of choices you want and results you expect. And really this is a circular flow. And this is what we call the role playing flow. And when we get people into this zone, we can basically do um, so many things to the narrative and give you limited choice and make things voyeuristic and not be a, a first person sort of uh, avatar driven game like Dragon Age and all these crazy things that you know, people thought impossible in a role playing game. Uh, but it was because we have this idea of uh, circular flow. And this is kind of the engine that drives a lot of the narrative in Mass Effect. So, uh, last point, it's the player's story. Um, when we say the player's story, we, we, we're really talking about this sandbox that we build. Nobody's story in Mass Effect really is the same. There's so many permutations. You could do missions in different order, you can do side quests and this and that, or you can just do critical path and everything. Um, everybody's story is unique. And that's what's really important to us. If you look at a lot of traditional games, and I'll even use Uncharted as an example, um, that is what I call a writer's story, where a writer really just kind of set out exactly what the beats are and all the rest of it, and you know, you're gonna go through this experience, more like a film. But in, in uh, the philosophy in Bioware, it's you know, the writer doesn't make the story, the player makes the story. The writer just gives the player the tools to make their own story. And that's something we really, uh, we really take uh, ownership of at, at Bioware, and we really take seriously. So when we talk about it's the player story, um, a good example of our commitment to that is this idea of the save game import. So this is actually one of our Uber features uh, for, for Mass Effect. And you know, it, it's, uh, it was not the easiest thing in the world to get in, but um, it really illustrates our commitment to continuing your story. You know, whatever your story was in Mass Effect 1, you're gonna continue it for Mass Effect 2 and Mass Effect 3. Uh, that whole story, those three games are gonna be your story. And most likely you can talk to your friends or whatever and you know, wow, I did this mission or that mission and I, and I talked to this person and you know, and I had a different, you know, I, I went through a dialogue differently. Uh, uh, they had me, I had a different result. Like there's all these permutations um, that make it your story. And when we look at that, uh, once again, it's, it's, it's this, this, this general idea of that it's your continuing story. This next bullet point uh, got me in trouble a little bit, but, um, but really, because uh, it, it, it was actually taken as 700 decisions uh, going from Mass Effect 1 to Mass Effect 2, and I'll just clarify that. Uh, the, it was actually about 100 decisions we uh, brought across from ME1 to ME2. But there were 700 places in the narrative uh, for ME2 which uh, were a direct result of that import. So when we look at um, this continuing story and the save game import, there's a lot of things that we kind of found out about it. Like firstly, it's impossible for us to make five different games. Council Alive, Council Dead, uh, you know, did you save Rex, didn't you save Rex? Like we couldn't have like these big sprawling stories that were just incredibly complicated and, and uh, you know, it's just, it's not feasible to do that uh, for the second game. Uh, but uh, one of the things that we did learn is that it's the small things that matter and it's the small things that make the story personal. So we're going to be looking at uh, some examples of how we made that story personal. So uh, here's a really ugly shepherd from ME1. And uh, this is kind of like one of the last choices you make in ME1 um, where you can either save the console or let them die. So in this example, we're going to let them die and see how that affected the game in Mass Effect 2. So when you're walking around the Citadel, there's uh, a lot of these advertising uh, kiosks around. And we're going to look at an ad that was put together uh, by a cinematic designer uh, that kind of illustrates how we dealt uh, with this choice and how we manipulated plot states uh, to give everybody a very unique experience in the world. And, and really it's all about, once again, the very small details that make it very personal. So we're going to look at a video of Council Dead. And what we're going to be looking at is a movie trailer of your 
adventures in ME1 and uh, how that changed depending on your choice. So the first one we're gonna look at is you are obviously male shepherd and you let the council die. It's a fall release, probably not as popular decision. Uh, there's a couple of things in there, you know, it's like you, you saw Shepard kind of condemning the council there. Uh, so we're going to look at that same interaction, but this time we chose to save the council and you know, what the hell, we're going to put female Shepard in there now too. And we're going to look at uh, how that interaction changed on ME2 based on that one choice. This began with an attack on a human settlement in the Traverse, but Saren won't stop there. His Geth aren't going to stay on the fringes of Citadel space. Abandon the Citadel, evacuate the council. The Citadel's closing. They're sealing the station. Is surrender not preferable to extinction? Commander, we're picking up reinforcements. It's the Alliance. This summer, humanity earns its place among the stars. Citadel, a film by Risa Uferson, presented by Aridani Film. We change it to a summer blockbuster. We put the, the male in there. So basically, there's an, there's an example of four different permutations that can happen with that one interaction. So when we talk about the 700 hooks, there's four of them right there. Um, so when you're, you know, you're going around the world, and this happened everywhere in, in Mass Effect through um, you know, TV and, 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 and radio stuff and uh, you know, announcements in the Citadel and, and, and uh, you know, obviously uh, bigger moments like meeting Rex and all the rest of that. Uh, but it's, it really shows our commitment. Like you would never get that content if you never played ME1, uh, you know, or you wouldn't get one of, the, one of those pieces of content. So it's really interesting because when you, when you work on Bioware games, it's all about this idea of hidden content. Like, you know, it's like we work on some of these interactions and we do the statistics on them, and it's like, wow, there's 2% of people, or our players are ever gonna see this. But that's what's important for us is making that a personal story. Uh, we're building these interactions for that 2% that are going to see it. And they're going to feel so awesome about that game because that game all, all of a sudden belongs to them.